Um, good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to see an audience. We had like the beginning of the week, just a couple of people signed up, so I'm glad you strolled in. We're also welcoming our speaker's father, who's here from California. Wonderful, welcome. I'm Teresa Levinson. I'm the nurse here at the Council on Aging, and very delighted to have a, one of our local uh, Weston um, uh, dentists, uh, periodontists. Um, she does a multitude of things for dentistry. Dr. Diane. Diane, did I say it right? Diane. Diane. Mm -hmm. um, speak to us this morning. Thanks. Welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm Sharona Diane, and I trained in periodontics at Harvard, and I also have a PhD in cancer research from Harvard um, at the Brigham and Women's University. The secret to prolonging your youth lies in preventing and treating age-related illnesses. Today, we will talk about three things related to your oral health that affect your um, general health. First, is there evidence that periodontal disease can shorten your lifespan? Second, what are the effects of missing teeth on the aging process? And third, if you are missing teeth, how can dental implants change your life? So let's get started. First, just so we're on the same page, let's talk about what periodontal disease is. It's also referred to as gum disease, gingivitis, and all of these terms describe an infection of the gums and the bone that anchor the teeth into the jawbone. On the left, we see a patient um, with the early stages of gum disease. And at this stage, there really are no symptoms. This is something that would be detected by the dentist or the dental hygienist using very specific instruments. This is the best time to treat the disease um, because the treatment is very conservative and minimal and you may be able to avoid surgeries and tooth loss. On the right, we see a patient with advanced periodontal disease. And at this stage, um, many of these teeth are no longer treatable and the ultimate consequence is tooth loss. Periodontal disease is one of the most common infections. Um, in the US. And how does periodontal disease affect your general health? Well, the bacteria that seed into the gums and on the root surfaces trickle into the bloodstream constantly, and they seed into different parts of the body. And they cause chronic inflammation, which can be very harmful over a long period of time. These are the many systems that can be affected by periodontal disease. So we'll talk about a few of the major ones. How many of you here are familiar with the NUN study? Um, the NUN study was a long-term study on aging and Alzheimer's disease. Um, it was funded by the National Institute of Aging, and 144 nuns participated in the study. These nuns had similar housing, similar medical care. They had no smoking history, similar diets. And they had the same dentist for 21 years. So this was a very strong study. And the definitive conclusion was that the nuns with periodontal disease and with more missing teeth from periodontal disease had more dementia and more Alzheimer's. <coughs> People with periodontal disease have a 20% higher risk of having a heart attack. Gum disease is a risk factor for stroke, for prostate cancer, pneumonia, and the relationship with diabetes is two-way. People with diabetes have a much higher risk of developing periodontal disease because of a, a lower ability to fight infection. And also, 
when you have periodontal disease, it is much more difficult to maintain diabetic control because chronic infection um, increases your blood sugar levels. So what can you do to protect yourself and to stay youthful and healthy for as long as possible? I am a big believer in prevention and early detection. And the most important thing that patients can do is to have professional cleanings every three months at a periodontal practice or alternating between a periodontist and dentist. And that way, early changes can be detected very quickly and we can take a very conservative, preventative approach. Twenty million people in the United States have no teeth. And there are several consequences to tooth loss. So today we'll talk about the aesthetic consequence. <coughs> We will talk about the health consequences of missing teeth, and we will also talk about the psychological aspects of missing teeth. The face that you see here is not a part of the normal aging process. This loss a facial structure here, the prominent chin, and the collapse of the midface is directly the result of missing teeth and losing the jawbone. And why do we lose the jawbone when you lose your teeth? Well, bone needs stimulation in order to maintain its strength and volume. And teeth are what give the jawbone the stimulation that it needs. How many of you guys have heard that doing mild weight-bearing exercises and walking can help prevent osteoporosis <coughs> and hip fractures. Have you guys heard that? Well, your jawbone is the same way. So once you lose your teeth, the jawbone loses the stimulation, and just one year after tooth loss, 25% of the volume is lost. This loss continues, and after several years of denture wear, you can see how thin the jaw becomes, the jaw can break very easily, and the denture begins to rest on exposed nerves that can be extremely painful. How old do you think the patient um, above is? How old do you think that lady is? Well, it says she's 33 years old. She lost all of her teeth as a teenager because of gum disease and cavities and she underwent reconstruction with implants, and this is how she looks after the reconstruction. How many of you guys think that she discovered her fountain of youth? Mm. A dental implant is the only device that can stimulate the bone the way that your teeth did and preserve the jawbone for a more youthful appearance. Teeth transmit chewing forces through their roots to the jawbone, and this provides the stimulation bone needs to stay healthy. So when a tooth is missing, the jawbone around the area begins to shrink along with surrounding gums. A missing tooth also changes the biting forces on teeth around the space. Neighboring teeth begin to shift, and the opposing tooth begins to extrude <coughs> into the socket. These changes create places around the teeth that are hard to keep clean, so plaque and bacteria quickly accumulate. This accumulation can cause tooth decay and periodontal disease. Changes in the bite can also put improper chewing forces on the shifted teeth, and this may lead to grinding and clenching and painful problems with your jaw joint, the TMJ. To determine if an implant is right for you, We'll do a thorough exam, which will include recording your medical history, performing a visual exam to check the health of your teeth and gums, taking panographic or panoramic x-rays and possibly CT scans to check the health of your jawbone, and taking impressions and bite registrations to create an accurate model of your mouth. An implant with a crown replaces a missing tooth, 
and it's a great way to keep your jawbone healthy, maintain a stable bite, and restore your beautiful smile. Every human celebration from birth until death involves food. There is a social aspect to being able to eat, and of course there is a health and nutritional aspect as well. The gentleman on the left has all of his own teeth and he can generate 250 to 500 pounds per square inch of force when he's chewing. He can chew anything he wants. The gentleman on the right has been wearing dentures for six years. He can generate six pounds per square inch of food. This man can barely eat anything that he wants. And as a consequence, there is a lower intake of fruits and vegetables, fiber, and vitamins, and the bolus that is swallowed is so coarse that many nutrients are not even absorbed. 30% of denture users rely regularly on medicine to treat their upset stomach. And blood tests indicate that people with missing teeth are deficient in vitamins A <coughs> and C, which can lead to skin and visual problems in the aging population. Dr. Dursley did my dentures, and I've been wearing dentures for about 40 years, and these are the best ones I ever had. That's great. I'd recommend it to the doctor to anybody. And what kind of dentures do you have? I have a full upper and I have a lower with implants. So those stay in without rocking or moving? Beautiful. Great. I love them. I can even eat steak even when it's tough. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's good. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> There's also a deep psychological aspect to missing teeth. In a survey of people with missing teeth, they reported that losing a tooth was like the death of a friend, and they had feelings of shame. 88% of denture users reported trouble speaking. Ten percent of people with dentures reported that they rarely leave the home because of their loss of self-confidence. And social activities like dining and dating continue throughout advanced life, but many denture users avoid romantic situations, especially if the partner doesn't know that they are missing teeth. <laughs> So what are the many advantages of dental implants? So you can eat the foods you love. For better nutrition and general health. Implants protect the adjacent teeth. And they last a long time. so you can enjoy many years of comfort and function. You can enjoy your family and community. You can speak with greater clarity. And you can feel more confident. <laughs> You know, I mean, are people going to run into issues no matter what when they have dentures? Absolutely. They will run into problems. Absolutely. It's just a matter of time because the bone loss continues and it doesn't stop until the bone atrophies to a very, very um, low level. 
Um, I would, what I would suggest for patients who have financial concerns, um, I mean, first of all, the implants will help to prevent so many other medical costs mm -hmm. that will result from having dentures. And implants, what's wonderful about them is that they can be staged. So if we recommend five implants in the lower jaw to stabilize the denture, you can get one implant a year until you have all five. You can get two implants a year. So the treatment can be staged. You don't have to have it all done at once. And that just helps a little bit to, to break up the, finance, the financial aspect of it. Do I dare ask what an implant cost? Mm -hmm. um, in our office, it costs about $2,300 per implant, and that's a pretty average rate. They usually range anywhere from $2,100 to $2,800 per implant. And insurance generally doesn't cover dental insurance. Would they cover implants? Well, most insurances don't cover the surgery to place the implants in the jawbone, but many insurances cover the teeth that attach to the implants. So there, will, there is some assistance, but many dental insurances max out at um, 1000 1500 But, uh, you know, until they reach the maximum, then mm, they do cover a portion of the teeth. And how long does it take? The question is, how long does it take to go through implant therapy from start to finish, including placing the implants, and then getting the, the teeth. So if you need a lot of bone grafting to be a candidate for an implant, it takes about, um, about two years to go through the treatment if you just you know, go through everything without um, stopping. But if you have the immediate bone that you need, then you place the implant, and six months later you can have your tooth. So it can be anywhere from six months up until three years for very advanced reconstructions. Sure, it a actually it's a very pretty simple procedure. Once the bone is available, we just separate the gums and get access to the bone and we place a post in the jawbone that replaces where your roots used to be. So it's like having a third set of teeth. Um, and this is really one of the most comfortable procedures that patients go through in the office and they rarely have to take any pain meds afterwards. Um, so it is a very, very predictable procedure without pain afterwards. The, the post is made of a titanium alloy, okay? So it doesn't have any reactions with the body and um, basically it fuses with the bone and as you start to stimulate it with chewing, it gets stronger and stronger over time. So it's like having a, another root, but it's made of titanium alloy. It's a waiting period for the bone to get really, really strong around the implant, okay? And then the crown that the dentist puts on goes over that post. So it looks like you have teeth again. Mm -hmm. And you can get, there's a couple of different kinds. What I always recommend is to get teeth that stay in so they become part of your body. You brush them like teeth, they stay in. Um, and also another option is if you already have dentures, you can get implants and attach the dentures to the implants so that that's what the lady in the video had so that the teeth, the dentures are very stable and you will stop the bone loss. So the doc lady, did she, did she pull out the, the dentures to clean them every night, but the implants stayed in place? Exactly. And even just having those, those individual implants that she had were enough to stimulate the whole jaw to stay healthy. That's really interesting because even if you just get five implants in the front of the jaw, the bone in the back still gets stimulated enough. Uh, because what you're doing is you're removing the, the, the pressure from the denture, and that is what is contributing to the bone loss. So once that pressure is relieved and you have five in anchors in the front, the bone levels in the back, even though you don't have implants there, stay protected. Does the crown go over this? Does the crown go over?
over this post. Yes. So that's a, that's an additional process, is that correct? That's, that's not addition. part of the implant process, right? No, that's an additional process. And usually it's a team effort between a surgeon, a periodontist, and a dentist, and the patient. So it's a three-way team. I have some um, models here that show the deterioration of bone after tooth loss. So this is how the jawbone looks when you have all of your teeth. And after tooth loss, it can shrink down to even this level. And that's what causes the facial collapse. And it happens for both jaws, both for the upper and the lower. The best time to get an implant really is soon after a tooth is lost because that's when you can preserve as much of your own bone as possible. And the treatment just becomes very easy. And many times we can use bone just from a jar so that the process is very comfortable and you don't, you know, if it's in the early stages we can do that so that you don't have to have bone taken from a different part of your body to reconstruct the area. So um, that just makes it all the more easier. And, and in the early stages, bone from a jar works just as well. But in the case that you don't get it early, then let's talk about that. <laughs> Where so, does the bone come from? Well, if, if, if a patient came in with bone levels between these two stages, Okay, then it is possible to still fully reconstruct the jawbone to its original level using bone from the hip. And wow. Hence the, the, the team effort, because yes. this is something you're not going to be able to do. I wouldn't say. do that, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. exactly. I would send that to a surgeon who has a lot of experience with this type of technique. And really the results are still wonderful and amazing for the patients. Is that a, um, a general anesthetic to take the bone? Yes. Mm -hmm. So usually the orthopedic surgeon will harvest the bone and then the oral surgeon will prepare it, shape it, and place it in the mouth. And you can get up to you know 20 millimeters of bone height back using um, a hip harvest. Is that... Um procedure just a needle aspiration? No. Oh. <laughs> no. <clears throat> and anywhere from your body that you take the bone from, it grows back. Okay, so sometimes even if we have to take bone from a different part of the mouth, um, all of that will come back. So you're not permanently losing any bone if, if it has to be harvested. And um, we have, there is a book here, A Consumer's Guide to Dental Implants, that I highly recommend. And we also have some you know, brochures with some pictures that um, you may want to take a look at. And what other questions do you guys have about periodontal disease, gum recession, implants? How do we know that we have gum disease um, short of pain? <laughs> Actually, gum disease is not painful at all, and that's okay. why it gets missed by so many people. Um, you, might, you might have some symptoms like bleeding when you brush or floss. Um, it is something that really, it's like high blood pressure. You can walk around and have it and never know it, and you need a blood pressure monitor to, to, to diagnose high blood pressure. And periodontal disease is really best diagnosed with special measuring instruments in the dental office and uh, CAT scans and x-rays. So those are the tools that we have to diagnose. As far as daily dental habits, um, we really recommend the Oral-B power brush to all of our patients. Um, the Oral-B in study after study has been shown to be more effective than manual brushing and it is the only power toothbrush on the market that doesn't contribute to gum recession. So that is um, my personal favorite and it also has some wonderful, wonderful tips that are so effective that they may even replace the need for flossing and much easier to use. Um, 
And as far as diet and nutrition, um, you know, protecting yourself from gum disease, or let's say you're going through a surgery and you want to maximize the healing process, it's basically just your the, the common sense nutrition. You want to get your grains, you want to get your vitamin C's, you want to get your dark green leafy vegetables and protein. Um, some foods and fruits are very highly acidic, and so if you're in the habit of eating a lot of fruits um, that are acidic, we certainly don't want you to stop, but just be aware that they can be a little bit erosive on the teeth, and how you can uh, reduce some erosion from, from fruits and fruit juices is one technique is to have fruit juice with calcium that completely takes away the erosive factor of the juice. You can have your fruit with yogurt. The calcium in the yogurt um, will also uh, cancel out the, the acid erosion from, from the fruit. Um, you can do a just a rinse with peroxide and water to neutralize some of the acid. So there's a few things you can do. We certainly don't want anyone to stop eating healthy fruits and vegetables, um, but just be aware that if you are in the habit of holding the fruit in your mouth for a long time, or you know, or holding like Coke in your mouth until the the carbonation goes away before you swallow, those extended exposures can be very harmful to teeth. Something else that we recommend as a supplement to our patients is the use of probiotics. Have you guys heard about probiotics? Oh, yeah. How many of you take probiotics? I, I do it in the, in the yogurt. In the yogurt. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Well, the history behind probiotics is that um, about 100 years ago, a scientist in the Louis Pasteur Institute in Paris made the observation that people who drank sour milk lived longer. Mm -hmm. And he actually, for the research that followed this observation, was awarded the Nobel Prize. And basically what's found in yogurt, what's found in the fermented uh, dairy is a really high concentration of good bacteria. Okay, because your, your primary immunity in your body is in your mouth and in your digestive tract. So we always want to have a very good flora with good, healthy bacteria in our digestive tract. A long, long time ago, just having yogurt may have been enough. Today, because of the processed foods, because of pesticides, because we're exposed to plastics, because there are antibiotics in our food, just having yogurt is not enough anymore. And the amount of yogurt that you would have to eat to get the beneficial effects um, really would be so mucin producing that you would start to have sinus issues and, and clogged, you know, con and congested sinuses. And now they have wonderful selection of probiotics that you can purchase at, at um, Whole Foods. Whole, I'm, I'm not that crazy about the selection at Whole Foods. It's the only product probably that I wouldn't go to Whole Foods for. But um, you can get pills that have a, a wide strain of, of healthy bacteria with many different organisms. And taking this a few times a week, you will be amazed how much it affects your general health because your immune system gets so healthy that the rest of your body is able to fight even fungal infections a lot better. Um, arthritis can get alleviated. Skin problems can get alleviated. So that's, some, that's a supplement that I would really recommend. In the last 10 years, Harvard has developed a probiotic that is specific for the mouth. So that if you have bacteria in your mouth that are cavity uh, producing or gingivitis producing, by taking a mint or a lozenge every day, you can shift the flora and convert it from harmful to healthy. And it's just taking a a delicious mint every day, and most people don't have a problem doing that. I use the uh, crest white strips once a year. Any, okay. Any mention? Yep. 
no, there's no harm in using white strips at all. Um, you know, it, it, they just don't go all the way back. So if you have a broad smile, some of the back teeth won't be whitened. And you really do have to have well-aligned teeth for the white strips to, to work really well. But um, there's absolutely no harm in that. There, there's no harm in, in whitening. Do you have a favorite product short of, you know, the, the dental tray with the juice um, in the, on, on, the, on the store counter, you know, over the counter product? Um, I don't recommend so much of the over the counters because what I find is that they, are just not effective enough and then you do get patients who use it and use it and you can burn the gum tissue because they're, they're not uh, custom made for your mouth. Um, still, the best technique is still using a tray with you know, a 30 minute pro bleaching product in the tray. They also have, in the office we have something called tray white and it is a pre-made tray. Um, and you just mold it to your teeth and leave it in for about 15 minutes, and that really does the job very well. And it's effective, so you don't have to use it, you know, over and over again. Um, could you mention, I, used, I smoked for 30 years, so could you mention something about the harmful effects? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, smoking is the biggest risk factor for periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. And it is also a big factor for oral cancer, which is the area that I studied at Harvard. Um, so um, many people don't know that you can get oral cancer, but certainly you can. Um, and the, the effects of oral cancer are really tragic. Your tongue has to be removed, half of your face has to be dissected out, and uh, many people don't survive it. So um, smoking is a big risk factor for both periodontal disease and oral cancer. Um, if you smoke, you can still get dental implants. You have actually, peep, implants do better in smokers than teeth do, um, but you do have about a 15% higher risk of infection um, after the surgery. I read once that in a newspaper that if you floss your teeth very regularly every day or twice a day, that you can see the uh, cleaning at the dentist's office. Is that correct? No. Yes. The question is, if you floss your teeth every day and and do your home care, can you skip professional cleanings? And you know, the, the answer is no. Um, like similar to when you have your carpets professionally cleaned. You know, the instruments that we have, the tools that we have are a lot more effective. The access that we have and our ability to get into those nooks and crannies um, is just, it really can't be repeated um, at home. I mean, of course, daily oral care is extremely important, but um, if you are prone to cavities, if you're prone to gingivitis, I mean, those three-month checkups are extremely important and professional cleanings are extremely important. We just have better access and better tools. So much goes into periodontal disease, of course, bacteria, but if you go through a hormonal fluctuation, that will affect your susceptibility to periodontal disease. If you go through, stress is a major risk factor for periodontal disease. Um, so you may be going through life changes and um, daily changes in, in, in your life that are affecting your dental checkups and you may never even know it, but still you're doing your routine the best that you know you can and flossing and brushing the way that you're supposed to and you can still get periodontal disease because that's not the only thing that goes into the expression of the disease. I'm really grateful that you brought your staff too. Yes, well thank Thanks. you so much and we're around to answer questions so thank you so much for your participation. Thanks.